Hello and welcome to the start of my miniature painting journey on YouTube. As I'll be mainly focused on the Middle Earth strategy battle game, I decided the old balance tomb diorama that's been gathering dust in the back of my closet for years would be a good place to start. And who better to paint up first than Mr... Underhill. My name's Underhill. Underhill. So today we're going to turn this into this. If you're excited to come on this journey with me, then take out your sting and stab it into the like button. Now let's paint ourselves a hobbit. I usually start my miniatures off with a black primer, and today is no different, having primed Frodo with matte black by the army painter. Surprisingly, despite having used the black primer, I now proceed to cover the entire model in regular black paint by Vallejo. The reason for this is it ironically is more matte than the matte primer, so it shows up nicer on camera and it also makes sure to cover any parts the primer might have missed. After all the preparations are done, it's finally time to start actually painting Frodo, starting with the largest object of all, the cloak. For the cloak, I mix together two parts black with one part black green as a base. I generally don't use washes on my models, so it's important to start each model from a dark point and slowly build up the brightness layer by layer. Now that the base layer is down, our next layer uses the same colors, but now only having one part black to one part black green. We are painting his cloak green, by the way, which shouldn't necessarily come as a surprise, but did you know that throughout some parts of the Fellowship of the Ring, Frodo's cloak turns blue? Including during the Balan's tomb sequence, probably something to do with how they edited the light in post-production, but it's something I never noticed until I started looking for source material to use as a guideline for this miniature. For the next layer we're still sticking to the same colors, but this time black green will take the reins with two parts to only one part black, as we slowly start seeing a difference between the shadows and the parts that catch the light. It's important to build this up over many layers as it will look far more natural than a single bright layer over a dark base. The next layer will consist solely of black green and is the final layer that will be covering all the raised areas. The final two layers will focus more on the higher parts of the model. The second to last layer will be an even mix between black green and flat green and still covers most of the raised areas but with a focus toward the higher areas. The final layer adds another part flat green for a 2 to 1 mix and only focuses on the highest points of the cloak, such as most of the hood and the shoulder areas. Now that the cloak is done, we will move on to the backpack, starting with another mixture that involves black. This time one part black to one part German camo black brown, covering the entire backpack from top to bottom. Once again we will start our process of increasing the brightness of each layer, this time increasing to two part German camo black brown to one part black. Next up is a layer of pure German camo black brown. Another layer is added, this time adding one part burnt umber to one part German camo black brown as we start increasing the brightness. I think having a decent contrast between dark and light is really important to make the colors pop, but you also don't want to go overboard with these Middle Earth miniatures as they are very much grounded in reality, which might sound weird when talking of a fantasy universe, but compare it to something like Age of Sigmar or even Marvel and you'll hopefully understand what I mean. Age of Sigmar has lots of bright colors of extravagant magic, whereas Middle-earth has lots of earthy tones and subtle magic, so with that in mind, that's how I try to paint these miniatures too. Meanwhile our backpack is onto the final layers with the second to last layer consisting of just burnt umber, and the final highlight adding one part English uniform to one part burnt umber, once again focusing only on the highest parts of the backpack. We're leaving the little straps alone for now as we will paint them in another step later. Finally on the backpack I show off a bit of black lining. I will generally do this after I finish any piece of the miniature, but I won't show it to you each time as the process is the same every time, and perhaps I'll make a specific video on this in the future. Next up are Frodo's pants, another part of the model that's going to be a shade of brown. It's not the first and it certainly won't be the last as it seems Frodo was a huge fan of drab brown colors. We start these off with pure German camo black brown. The next layer will add some Katachan flesh, the first citadel paint I've used so far in this video. 
As of this moment, my paint range consists of about 50% Vallejo paints to 50% Citadel paints as I started out with Citadel when I jumped into the hobby, but then started moving into Vallejo a few years ago to try them out as well. I won't get into them too much at the moment as paint ranges will certainly be another great topic for a future video, but for the moment I've added a paint conversion chart in the description that should generally have a decent replacement for paints from a range you might not own. In the meantime we've moved on to another layer, which consists of two parts Katachan flesh to one part German camo black brown. And to finish off the pants we will do a final layer of pure Katachan flesh. On to the next part of our ring bearer. Bright blue his jacket is. Oh wait, wrong ring bearer. Frodo's jacket is yet another drab brown. So drab in fact that we will use steel legion drab on his jacket. But not yet. The first layer will consist of pure dryad bark. The second layer however will add a part of steel legion drab to two parts dryad bark. Once again making sure to cover the raised areas and leaving the darker colors where the light wouldn't reach it. Also don't be afraid to cover an area multiple times with the same mixture before moving on, or going back to a darker color to fix any mistakes you might have made, or simply to darken the darker areas a bit more. The third layer adds yet a bit more Steel Legion drop to the mixture. And lastly we paint the final highlights of pure Steel Legion drop. Make sure not to forget the sleeves during this whole process like I did part way through, and once again we will be leaving the buttons as we will paint them in a later step together with the straps on the backpack and the buttons on his shirt. Speaking of shirts, that's the next thing we'll be painting. What color you ask? You guessed it, brown. A more reddish brown this time though as we start with a base layer of Rhinox hide. We're keeping the shirt fairly simple with only two more layers, the first consisting of one part of the aforementioned Rhinox hide to one part flat brown, and the final layer simply being flat brown. Once again, leave the buttons be as we will get to them later. And by later, I mean right now! And by right now, I mean right after we cover this tiny bit of undershirt with Steel Legion drab. But once that's done, we will also cover all of the buttons and straps with Steel Legion Drab as well. The ones on his shirt, the sleeves on his jacket, the straps on his backpack, and even the little clasp holding the cloak together around his neck. Let's go back to the only bright piece of clothing Frodo wears and add a layer of Wraith Bone to his undershirt and call it done. After that grueling step was done, it was time to finish the buttons, which I gave a quick touch of Karak Stone to make them stand out a little more. The skin is where things get interesting, as I used a perhaps somewhat unorthodox set of paints. I find that almost all so-called skin colored paints don't really look like skin. They often come out too pink or too pale, so I mix my own. Credit where credit is due, I did not come up with this mixture myself, but like a fearful little hobbit, I stole it from Flame On Miniatures, an incredible miniature painter who's absolutely worth checking out if you want to feel bad about your own work. Anyway, back on topic, the mixture starts off with one part flat brown to one part flat earth, and once this is properly mixed together you add a part of white. You can increase or decrease the amount of white you want for your base layer depending on how exactly you want your skin color to be. For any subsequent layers, you just keep adding a bit more white to get brighter and brighter highlights. Make sure to cover all of Frodo's skin, his head and neck, hands, but of course also his bare feet. Just be careful not to cover the hair on his feet as we'll be getting to that after the skin. More white is added every time I paint another layer of skin, whilst also covering less and less with each layer. For example, make sure to focus on the knuckles on his hands, the nose and cheekbones on his face, and his toes and ankles on his feet. Finally I painted the eyes off camera as I couldn't get a good angle on them for the video, but this is another topic that I will certainly cover in a future video. For Frodo's hair we're going to a paint we definitely haven't used enough yet today, German Camo Black Brown. This is the darkest earthy brown I have, so it's often a color I use as a base. The base for Frodo's hair is actually the black we painted on all the way at the start of the video, 
so we're really only painting the individual strands of Frodo's hair, which is easiest done using the side of your brush. Make sure to cover the hair on his feet as well. After the previous layer has dried, we're only doing one more layer, and that's chocolate brown. Frodo's hair is very dark, so I didn't want to paint his hair too bright. Finally, it's time to move on to Sting, Frodo's elvish blade handed down to him by his uncle Bilbo. For this blade, I decided to go with a simplified version of my non-metallic metal paint scheme. I know I've said this a lot, but this is absolutely another topic for a future video, and thus I won't go into too much detail on it here. I also didn't think it was worth spending too much time on this, as I knew I would cover it with a glow afterwards anyway, because we all know the blade glows blue when orcs are close. And it's times like that, my lad, when you have to be extra careful. Simply put though, the idea is to have a very high contrast between dark and light on the blade. So in essence, you blend all the way from black to white to give the illusion of real steel. Like I said though, the way I paint Sting here is not a great example of it, but it works well enough for our purposes. We finish off Sting by painting the hilt with some good old German camo black brown, followed by flat brown as a highlight and some metal stripes as seen on the real prop. Just one more little detail to go before our young hobbit friend is ready to face the long dark of Moria. And that's the aforementioned blue glow of Sting. For this I use light turquoise washed down with heaps of Lamian medium to make a glaze. And due to the way we painted the non-metallic metal on Sting, the tip will still appear bright, even when we add a second layer of the same mixture with some added white at the very tip of the sword. I did consider adding object source lighting by spreading the glow to Frodo himself, but in the movie this sword doesn't really give off any light, at least not when Frodo uses it. It's another story when Bilbo has the sword in the Hobbit movies. But I also tried this on a different Frodo where I went a little overboard with the OSL, and I decided to just not bother at all. I'll leave that for when Gandalf risks a little more light. Before putting Frodo on his balanced tomb style base, I give him a double wash of ultra matte varnish by AK Interactive. Personally, I'm a huge fan of matte finishes, but most matte varnishes are still fairly shiny. This is absolutely not the case with ultra matte varnish. Even a single coat will generally get rid of any shine, so I mostly add the second coat for extra protection. It's a brush on varnish too, which I find a lot less risky than spray varnishes, with which I've had some poor experiences. With all that finally done, I've gone ahead and put Frodo on a simple base that is easy to make and goes well with the balanced tomb diorama. For the final time this video, I will tell you that this is another topic for another video. Basing my minis is one of my favorite things about the hobby, so I'll definitely cover all sorts of bases, from simple balanced tomb bases to elaborate forest bases and everything in between. Now that Frodo is done and placed with the rest of the fellowship on the diorama, it's time to decide who to paint next and I think perhaps you can help me with that. Let me know in the comments who your favorite character from the Fellowship is and why, and perhaps they'll be the one I paint next. Thank you all very much for watching my first video on this miniature painting journey on YouTube, and make sure to like the video if you did, subscribe if you'd like to see more. Maybe share this video with your fellow hobbits if you think it might entertain them as much as a pint from the Green Dragon. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day.